Um, so who's your favorite highlight musician of all time? You mean besides you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I me, me, I, I'm with the highlight, but I'm not a highlight musician. So who is that? True. Um, <laughs> Favorite highlight musician of all time? I definitely like the the. Uh, I'm a big fan of the whole Sweet Talks International uh, collection. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with yeah. that. Uh, that's that's a collection I like very well. And of course, Iron Boy is definitely also uh, one of the guys I I love. And and then Podunchi might just. I want you to the day Iron Boy. Iron Boy, one hundred percent. Which one will it be? Um, hmm, interesting. Amachi Dede, uh, Iron Boy, actually the, the song Iron Boy does it for me. I mean, and there's a joke about how he okay. sang that song only because he said, people said he couldn't speak English. So this was his comeback to say, hey, Chelly, I've, I've, I've come, I've come up with an English song and it's Iron Boy. So Iron Boy is actually one of the great ones. It's a good one. Excellent. So speaking of being an iron boy, I think um, I, I absolutely admire you for your business savvy and, the, and your tenacity in your field. So let's get to what we're trying to talk about today, how to attract funding, you know, for an idea. And um, why, are you, why are you passionate about that and how does it relate to your journey? Like as a, as a business person, can you just, just, just give me... Just sound off, let us know why it is that this is important to you, how it relates to you. Look, I mean, first off, um, I've been through it all. Um, and and, and in, in setting up a number of businesses, um, some of which I succeeded at, others, that, uh, others I failed terribly at. Uh, one of the big things is always funding um, and, and attracting uh, funding. Um, and also, I'm at a stage in my life where I come into contact with a lot of high net worth individuals who are looking for places to, to put money. Uh, I am totally convinced now more than ever that there are more people who are looking to place money than people who are actually looking for money. Uh, the problem is, hmm. yes, you did hear me right, uh, Ahmed. There are more people who are looking to place money than people who are looking for money. There's just a complete disconnect between the people who want to place money and the people who are looking for money. So um, I guess the bridge would be some of these conversations or some of these engagements that potentially would, would, would match people who are looking to, to place money and people who are looking for money. Bear in mind, well, in Ghana, you can place money in a secured uh, T-bill investment for what, 12, 13%. Sure. Uh, inflation is at 10, 8 to 10 percent. So technically, at the end of the year, you're not making much. Um, and, and then, of course, if it's a CD investment, there's also the risk, potential risk of uh, foreign exchange loss. So people don't make much. By the time you go into the mature, the developed world, the developed markets, they make a, a quarter of a percent in interest. So definitely, uh, High net worth individuals are looking for ideas to back with their money, hoping to, to obviously multiply their investments. Yeah, and, and, and this is not charity. This is an idea of, this is pure economics. This is an idea of sort of exploring innovative ways in which to develop revenue and to actually have an impact beyond that, right? Yeah. I mean, some of it is also uh, people buying influence, right? Um, so I might invest in a, in a, in a radio station um, first because it potentially will bring me um, financial uh, revenue or return. But then also it potentially would bring me influence as a businessman or a politician or one thing or another. So there's, there are also other reasons besides financial benefit why people invest in, in businesses. So, yeah. Yeah. You know, the crazy thing is, well, it's not crazy. But the interesting thing is that in the past week, I've been engaging in, I mean, after brand ambassador, yeah, yeah, round of applause. <laughs> As, uh, you, chop, you, chop, you chop the cash, you know, bring me some. Oh, you I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not smiling at that, right? It's about bringing value, 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 you know. <laughs> but uh, Give me the cash and take the value. <laughs> but engaging people in the idea of what is going on with startups, their stories, their challenges, etc., Funding was, I think, 
the top most thing that came up all the time. Mm. In, 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 I mean, there are people who don't know. They're like, oh, the government should give us funds. There are people who are like, oh. So how do you attract funds for an idea? How do you even know that the idea is even good in the first place? How, how do you go about mm. it? And you, you can use mm. an example from your experience, like how you started off, whether it's Uber shop, whether it's real estate, anything, mm. and, and how you've gone about it. Give me solid examples that people can relate to and, and, and how to go about it. So I'll tell you two stories. Um, one that involved me as a, a financier and another that involved me as a person who has an idea looking, looking for funding. So I don't remember how long ago this was. This must have been maybe about 10, 12 years ago, uh, maybe 15. I was moving to a new home, and in the area in which I was moving into, the, the, there were challenges with water. So I was considering a borehole. I'm home one day. A guy walks into my house and offers to dig me a well, a handbag well and says, this can provide me enough water, if not for anything at all, for my gardening and for use in the bathroom. I said, that sounds like a great idea. I said, but why would I risk it with you? I don't know you. I don't know what you've been able to do before. The guy says to me, you know, I, I don't remember what the amount was at the time, but let's just say he says he wants $2 million for the for the handbag. Well, he says to me, um, don't pay me a dime. I just need you to buy me two pickaxes so I can, I can get a friend to join me to dig this hand, handbag well. Give me, uh, you don't even need to give me the money. Just give me two pickaxes. Just buy me two pickaxes and the deal will be that you only pay me a CD more when I'm done digging the handbag well. So that's story number one. And we'll, we'll get into the details of the individual story. Story number two was what? Six, seven years ago, um, when I set out to, to launch Zuba Shop with, with a partner of mine, uh, we were obviously looking for funding. And um, there were a few doors that I knocked that obviously were not successful. But the interesting thing is that two people who eventually decided to invest there? money in... Sorry? Are you there? No, go ahead. I think there was a okay. slight delay. Okay, so the two people who eventually decided to invest money in Zuba Shop invested um, after a 10-minute conversation and then maybe a 15-minute conversation respectively. Now, I had spent days and hours and tons of emails with other people who didn't invest, but the two people who eventually invested money in Zuba Shop invested after a 10-minute and a 12- or 15-minute conversation respectively. Are you serious? No. I'm serious, I'm, and, and I'm talking, I'm not talking change, eh? I'm talking significant amount of money. So while I was excited by the fact that my search for, for or my looking for money had ended, I, I was, it, it gave me a lot of sleepless nights. And the reason it gave me a lot of sleepless nights was because it dawned on me that these people could not have been investing in the idea or the project Zuba Shop because they could not have heard about Zuba Shop projections, business plan, et cetera, in 10 or 12 minutes. They could not have. Mm -hmm. So they must have been investing in something else. And what was that something else? They were backing me. And so essentially, I, I'm now, yes, I've gotten the funding I needed to do what I needed to, what I needed the money for, but I was in a corner where two people have essentially bet their money on me. And the thought was good, but it was scary as well. It meant that I had to do everything to make sure I didn't disappoint them. Now, so the reason I tell these two stories, I mean, both of them give a different perspective to what you need to do to attract funding. The one about Zuba Shop and myself just essentially says that for the most part, when you're looking for funding, especially within the fraternity of people you know, what they know about you prior to you raising the funding or you going to them for funding is what would count whether they give you money or not. I'm not sure mm. if any business idea per se or, or the business plans that they see. Yes, of course, that comes second as well. They will do some kind of due diligence. But for the most part, it is who you are, what they perceive you to be, your business values, your ethics, et cetera, et cetera, that determine whether these people will invest. 
Because remember that at the time, for the most part that you're looking for funding, you probably don't have a running business. You probably may not even have a proof of concept. So <laughs> they are essentially just betting in the dark, so to speak. They've seen a nice document and they're backing it, but it's not guaranteed return for them. You know, That's with the first story, with the second story. With the first story, um, it just speaks to skin in the game. Okay, a lot of people are looking for funding to set up a business. But the question you ask them is how much of your own skin is in the game? Say you came to me, Ahmed, and said you wanted to raise 5000 because you wanted to do a show. Okay. And well, well, can you say 500000 just so we are clear the skill, the skill we are dealing with? Say 500000 no, I usually think in thousands. So when I say five thousand, I meant five million dollars. <laughs> like that. <laughs> yeah. So say you come to me and say you 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 want you're looking to raise five million dollars. You want to set up whatever um, uh, an incubator or some some or a record label. Now. The first thing that's important to me as a prospective investor is how much of your own skin have you put in the game? Let's just say mm. I know you own a property in cantonments that's worth, let's say, $3 million. Yeah. Now, it would give me a lot of comfort to know that you've either sold or mortgaged or, or loaned or whatever that property and raised, let's say, $1.5 million and put it in the pool. And what you're looking for is the difference to make it work. That tells me that you believe enough in the project for you to put your house at stake. So you, you have as much at stake to make mm. the business work as much as I do as an investor. Now, this guy who offered to dig me a hand that well and said, all I need is two pickaxes. For me, the risk was, was very minimal because I needed to just buy two pickaxes that I could keep if, if it didn't work out. Yeah. But he had offered to me only to have to pay for the hand dug well when the, when the well was working. So it told me that he was willing to put his money where his mouth was, put skin in the game, and say, I'm willing to, to, uh, to, to enter into that kind of an arrangement to make you comfortable. That is the kind of thing that a prospective investor finds exciting. No. So don't come to me, and, I, and at this point, I don't mean you are met. Don't come to me as, a, as a, a person with an idea and say you're looking to raise... 5,000 Ghana CDs, um, yet you have an iPhone 11 that's worth four and a half thousand. You are still holding on to it, and you want my 5,000 to invest in that idea of yours. That doesn't work. Uh, uh, look, not to put you on the spot, are you using an iPhone? No, I don't use a fruit for a phone. A successful businessman like yourself, you don't even care for an iPhone. Is there a lesson in here somewhere? Well, look, um, probably, um, I mean, P.K. PK Amwabing says it all the time, and he lives it. I mean, and, and I mean, P.K. Amwabing from UT Bank, uh, a good friend of mine, he lives it and he says it all the time. A lot of us are in a hurry to show off to our friends and family how business is starting to do well. And so just when the money starts trickling in, we're in a hurry to get a, a, a nice smartphone, nice flashy car, move into a good neighborhood, DSTV, Netflix, et cetera. And it's interesting you ask because when I was, I mean, I started work really early. And I remember in the environment I used to work, um, it was a big conversation that we had frequently. At the time, um, having DSTV in your home meant you had to pay, I don't recall, I think it was about $80. And my paycheck at the time was the equivalent of about $160. Um, and I just simply didn't matter what DSTV had to show. I just simply couldn't justify a recurring expenditure of $80 when my paycheck was $160. And to this point, one of the, I think one of the mistakes a lot of people mm. make in this country is essentially how they treat rent. Rent is a recurring expenditure. It's not a capital expenditure. Mm. So the way a lot of us treat rent is that the guy earns maybe two and a half thousand Ghana cities, okay? He lives in a property that is worth maybe 1,800, 2,000 Ghana cities a month. The reason he doesn't feel that that rent is not the right 
fit for him is because he has to pay for this rent once every two years. So he goes and takes a loan and he treats it like a capital expenditure, like he went and bought a car. <laughs> and he pays the rent and he forgets about it. But the way to look at rent essentially is how much do I earn every month? How much am I willing to spend out of that earning to pay rent every month? Whether you pay it upfront, whether you pay it in arrears, whether you pay it monthly, quarterly, is irrelevant. But so to your point, the choices we make um, as far as money is concerned and re recurring expenditure is concerned is a big deal. Uh, and so, yes, one has to watch that. Okay, okay, so give me, there's just some quick facts for the people because I've seen, look, I saw stats of Accra. I saw a couple of people making comments about, like, what are the traits or what are the things to look out for. Put, your, put yourself, put your other hat on, which is as an investor. Uh, and, and, and give me, I don't know, three, six of, of, of pointers of what you would be looking out for, what you think is important in trying to attract funding. Okay, if you give me 10 minutes, 10, 12 minutes. No, I'll, I'll give you 10 minutes. Now and then, it's too much. <laughs> <laughs> you have to give me okay. quick pointers. So, <laughs> I'll, I'll give you a quick one. So I sort of have it in three different categories. Category one is uh, you have an idea. This is actually pre-fundraising. Category two is the process of fundraising. And category three is general tips. So number one, as far as pre-fundraising is idea, number one, uh, you have an idea. What do you do? First thing is you should document the idea. Yeah. The documentation of the idea helps to give you yourself clarity more than anything else. And then it mm -hmm. also helps you to be able to share the idea. Number two, find believers and critics and also a mentor. These people just help you shape and fine tune the idea. Some of it is a, a dreamland idea. Some of it is financially viable, et cetera, et cetera. Wait, I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop you on that point. That, sure. that, that that I think is critical. That's something that, you know, creatives and other people who have non-traditional startups even identify with. But the the how to in, in this Ghana we day sometimes people they come like how to find that kind of mentorship or people to bounce it off. Because look, I'll give you an example as a musician. I go fit day studio. I can get people that I know who love me and etc. And they they'll come and be cheerleaders right but to know who yeah. to invite to be a critic or to be a person to give me feedback that is essential in shaping an idea to go from good to great or to go from okay to amazing it's a whole different point i mean how do you how, how, how does one go about that kind of business i mean how, how how do you make sense of what is the process to get to those people how do you how, what, what personally what do you do Okay, so so depending on the size of your idea or the size of your business, there are different things you do, but the tricks pretty much work across. So to the point that you made, you're in the studio, um, an idea has come, a, a rap has come, you've written the rap down, an idea for a big song has come. First thing is you actually do need some believers. You need people who would blindly follow you and give you the kind of vim that you need to wake up from your bed and go back to the studio. So you need believers, for sure. Okay, okay. So whether the believers are genuine or not is another thing altogether. But you definitely need believers because if you get hounded every day by critics, uh, it, it takes a bit of a toll on you. So you definitely need believers. Then yeah. you need a critic. And, and I'm probably one of your, your harshest critics. Uh, every time we have conversation about your tracks, I'm telling you, for example, personally, I want a few more danceable tunes. I want <laughs> a bit there, there. You know me. I always tell you as it is, okay? <laughs> so you need critics. The critics help you shape the idea. Then you need mentors. Now, a mentor, and a lot of people see a mentor necessarily as somebody who's better than you or bigger than you. No. A mentor is just somebody who provides essential input into that idea from experience or from knowledge. A mentor could be a lecturer. A mentor could be somebody who knows more in the specific industry. A mentor could be somebody who frequently um, uh, patronizes that product or that service and therefore knows a lot more about it than you do. So a mentor is just somebody who gives you a different perspective. And ideally, you shouldn't have one. You should mm -hmm. have two, three. Um, they help to just shape the idea. So I'm going to move on because I know you're going to stop me if I don't move quickly. Number three... Yeah, yeah is do some basic research. Um, 
about the product, the service, the market, your target, pricing, competition, basic research, because these are questions that a prospective investor will ask you. So do some basic research. Then this is the one that gets a lot of people cringing, write a business plan. Now, from where I sit, from where I sit, a business plan essentially, uh, and, and people are sh sh shifting now, a business plan is simply a document it can be a one-page or two-page document that basically summarizes the idea for somebody who doesn't know the business to be able to read and understand that this is the idea. And remember, that was number one, document your idea. It doesn't matter what form it's in. It could be in Word, it could be in Excel, whatever. It's just a summary of the business as you have envisaged it or you've dreamt it for somebody else to appreciate. Mm -hmm. Then the second part of the business plan essentially should be some kind of financial projections if you can put it together. How much money are you, and it's not a set of accounts. It's over a period, let's say six months or a year, how much money do you think this business will bring in? How much money do you think this business will need to run? And over the period, this is your net profit or loss, and this is how you plan to grow the business. A business plan is not a 1700 page complicated document. It is just transcribing your ideas on a piece of paper and, and putting a few numbers to it. You can fine tune it later. But... Okay. So, I mean, I, I'm in a realm in which, for instance, when I walk into a room and a meeting, my manager and I, the business plan might be me in terms of having an elevator speech. How does the business plan, you know, um, correlate to an elevator speech? Like being able to have a succinct idea that you present. How does the business plan help that? Or what, what, how, how is it close to that? Because there are people. There are people with amazing ideas, so Albert. Wait, Charlie, yeah. to be honest, they don't even know how. The business plan is an esoteric foreign idea to them, but they might have I a later speech. Look, I understand. And, and, I, and I hesitated to use that, those exact words, business plan. Um, you can call it anything else you want. You can call it um, a business write-up or a background write-up, whatever you want. But like I said, it's just simply a few paragraphs about the business and a few numbers. Now, remember that it's not everybody who will invest in you that you might get an opportunity to meet. A lot of high net worth individuals are very difficult to come into fiscal contact with. Before they agree to grant you audience, they have to have seen something or some PA or some executive assistant must yeah, have no. looked at a piece of paper and said, this is interesting enough for us to, to, to drill down further. But yes, you're right, an elevator speech a pitch or speech also does a similar thing. Except that again, even then, most people will still say, send me an email with something. I need to see something on paper. Yeah. So that document, and I, again, I hesitate to call it a business plan because when you say business plan, most people think it's a 100-page document. No, it's not. Yeah, it's just yeah. transcribe your thoughts in the idea for somebody who does not know about the business to appreciate the idea. And the second part of it is some kind of numbers. And it can be as crude as two or three pages where your ideas and your numbers. If the prospect is interesting enough, the person will ask for a bit more information and then you can provide that information either in a verbal presentation or, or, or in some additional documents. So don't be scared too much about putting a business plan together. Fair enough. Number five, determine what your capital needs are. It's very important. If you're coming to a prospective investor for money, um, if they ask you how much money do you want, you're not going to say, I don't know. You need to be able to say, I need 50000 to to set up the business. I've raised twenty. I need twenty eight, And um, so I'm hoping you can give me 28000 uh, 28, um, um, for the business. And then number six is you have to have clarity in your mind as to what you are proposing to give to this person um, in exchange for the money they give you. Um, it could either be you're taking a loan, in this case it's debt, you are giving them part of your company, you're giving them part of the product, whatever it, it, it will be. You have to have clarity in your mind about what it is that you're exchanging for the funding that you're looking for. So yeah. in my mind, this, these will be the six uh, things you need to do um, pre-fundraising before you even think of going to someone uh, to raise money. A lot of people get the opportunity to speak to high net worth individuals who potentially can invest their business. 
But by the time they get there, they haven't done these six things. And so the questions start coming. How much do you need? Um, oh, no, I need to buy a car or a mixer. No, how much do you need? There has to be clarity in your thoughts and in your presentation, how much you need, what you're asking for, what you're trading that money for. All of that has to be crisply put together, whether written or not. So this will be the first six for pre-funding. Now, the next thing for um, the actual fundraising, again, that's also what I put together, six tips. Number one is start by bootstrapping. Uh, I'm sure you've heard that word wait, a number wait. of times. Wait, hold on, hold on. Funny enough, there was a question that came up about how important is bootstrapping, so you just answered the question, so go ahead. <laughs> it's, it's, bootstrapping is the most important thing, in fact. That's why it's number one. Um, and for maybe a few of your listeners who don't know what bootstrapping is, bootstrapping is essentially putting in your own financial resources into your business as a way to start it up while you wait for other, other funds to come in. This could be financial. It could be assets that you've used as guarantee. It could be anything. It could be using anything. But essentially, this is your own financial and social extra commitment that you're making to the business. To the point in the story that I made about the guy with the handbag well, this is what shows the prospective investor that you have skin in the game. So if your skin is in the game, there's a good chance that you're not going to take my money and, and go and blow it because you have skin in the game. And usually the more skin you have in the game, the more attractive you are as a, as a prospective uh, uh, fundraiser. Um, well, 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 and just to break careful, it down though, people, in the game meaning in terms of your what commitments or, or that you have brought into this business right correct, like, correct. Yeah. correct. correct. so and it, 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 so it could be financial it could be non-financial for example um if you say to me that you quit your job to go and run the business yes mm. you may have put all your life savings which is even two thousand ghana cities into the business 2,000 Ghana cities compared to the 100,000 you're trying to raise is, is considerably small. But if you tell me that you've quit your job to come and run this business, it also means that you believe in the idea so much that you've quit earning an income and you're looking to start a business. So skin in the game could be financial, but it could be many other things as well. It, essentially, the sacrifices that you've had to make um, yeah. in your belief of the idea. So that's yeah. number one. Number two is your first consideration should be family and friends. Okay, so reach out to people who are close to you, people who know you, and people who might put money behind you, not necessarily because they understand and believe in the idea 100%, but because um, they know you enough to, to want to commit small amounts of money. Usually you're talking anything between $0 to, to about $10,000. And this is typically what friends and family would be, would be able to give to you. Um, when we get to that, I'll, I'll talk about how friends and family comes in and how it's important to keep. Um, and then also for most people, especially people who don't know you, um, it is, they find it attractive that other people besides you have invested in the business. They don't want to be the first ones coming and investing their money in the business. So Ahmed, you are setting up a business besides you, who else has invested in the business? You say, okay, Maybe if we has invested some money, Albert Bigger has invested some money. Um, maybe Black Stars Fund has invested some money, et cetera, et cetera. It gives them comfort that other than you, there are other people who also think this idea is viable and this idea is bankable. So friends and family is your first tier of people who um, you can easily raise money uh, from. Okay. So, so no, no, I'm going to stop you. I have to because you know me. I, I represent for the man them for the look. You see, because people are always trying to find a way around things. There are people who feel feel um, handicapped. They will, they'll be like, look, I'm not in a position. I'm a person with great ideas. I have worked my way through life, created opportunity, etc. This friends and family to begin with model is not applicable to me. Are they tripping or is there another way to look at it for people who really feel that way? Look, I would, I would, be, very, I would be very concerned about investing in 
a business idea on someone who says to me, I have no friends and family who are willing to invest in the business. Mm. Note that investing mm. in the business does not mean financial necessarily. So, for example, I want to set up a fast food joint. Okay, you, Ahmed, might say, I don't have any money to invest in my business. However, I have 20 workers that I feed every day. What I could do for you is that I could give you an order for their food. So every day, you're getting 20 packs from my restaurant to you. That's friends okay. and family. That's another way you generate revenue. Uh, if you exactly. don't have friends and family, people who believe in the idea, who are willing to either put money or put skin in the game, uh, I'm, I'm very concerned as a prospective investor. I, I, I doubt if I want to. Yeah. The third point is find angel investors. And um, the, the first time I heard the word angel investor or angel, um, it sounded a little weird to me. It sounded like getting <laughs> some free money. Let me emphasize that an angel investor is not necessarily a philanthropist. Uh, is not a guy who's throwing away their money. An angel investor is someone who comes in at the very, very early stages of a business when it hasn't yet blossomed. And usually angel investors are people who either have something to do in the value chain of the business. Say, for example, I own a factory that processes maize, okay? And mm -hmm. you come to me and say you're trying to raise money um, to set up a maize farm. So it kind of makes sense. So... Um, from the, the prospect, apart from investing money and making a return, is that potentially you can supply me with maize for the processing I do in my factory. So usually angel investors are people who are closely knit to the business, or sometimes, again, family and friends. Um, but it's important to note that angel investors are not philanthropists. And, yeah, they are um, investors. The, the, the thing says yeah. investors. <laughs> well, they are investors. The, the, the thing that angel investors do that other investors don't do is that they tend, to, they tend to make a decision very quickly about whether or not they are going to invest. They don't okay. keep you waiting. They don't ask for 10 reports and a 100-page business plan. They tend to be very quick in deciding whether they want to invest or not. And for the most part, you bootstrap, you raise some money, you do family and friends, you still need money. And, and time is of the essence. So an angel investor comes in early stage and they put in some money. Uh, but the note here is that most angel investors, especially if they're investing in exchange, will take quite a chunk of your business if you don't negotiate well. So, Like the, the, the equity, huh? Yes. So that, that's the caution there. You need to be able to negotiate well to make sure um, that, yes, they are bringing you money, um, but but they are not taking away your business. Okay, okay. okay. Then Good number question. four. Question. Question. Yes. No, 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 no. Ah, me there. You know, say I go ask you questions. So make make it sure. turn that turn. <laughs> Look, sure. this equity thing is very. It, it's 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 something that can be very puzzling for people beginning a business with not much information, right? Because look, no. you know, as has been often told to me, a hundred percent of zero is zero, right? So Absolutely. You, if you have an investor who's coming in to try and get 80% of equity, like what, give me at least one or two guidelines in which you want people to think of in terms of what they would be willing to give away in terms of their company or their, 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 their business. Where obviously it depends on, there's so many factors, but in your, yeah. maybe use your experience as a thing. Because for me, for instance, right, I'll give you an equivalent. Yeah. As an artist, Going to a label is basically going to an investor and etc. And uh, giving away a certain level of control. So that yeah. So to a certain extent, when they're giving me a certain amount of money, they're going beyond maybe a fifty percent equity stake in the business. So they are going to make some certain final decisions. As an artist, at this stage of my career, I would not do that. I was having a conversation with Fui about this earlier. Like at this stage of my career, I can't afford that. Maybe if I was like nineteen. I would do that and just try it out, right? And if it doesn't mm -hmm. work for me, I, you know, so I wouldn't You're do so that now because, because I know that I have the pulse of the community, the, the, the audience, the consumer, et cetera. I can't let somebody else who has invested in it make those decisions because they have the majority stake in it. So what would be, just one actually, be so before you go on, just not to derail you so much, mm -hmm. what would be one kind of piece of advice or thought piece, like what would, should somebody think of in terms of 
this equity question because that's what a lot of people have to give up because they don't have Ooh. what else do they have and quite that they are going to whatever they, they cannot they cannot uh, promise some return on investments that you know some of these ideas they are brilliant ideas so but like you said there's no proof of concept there's so many things they are we mm. are gone out albert like a lot of things there's novelty okay. there's a lot I'm of not, new not, ideas let me remind you, I'm the resource person. You're doing my job. You're, you're saying all the things I'm supposed to be saying. Patience, <laughs> patience. Okay. I'll give it to you. Patience. I'm asking you so look, one idea, one I idea, think. one idea would be that um, at the angel investor stage, as much as possible, don't see control. Mm. Um, as much as possible, don't see control. However, under extreme circumstances, you, we, we may consider it. And the way to ensure that you don't see control is twofold. Number one is that you need to say to the prospective investor that if you are taking 80% of my business and I'm only keeping 20%, essentially I am an employee of some sort. And, and, and I have, I'm the one with the idea. So I need to be able to, to lead the charge. And, and if I were the person with idea, I generally will be worried about a person who wants 80% of my business and wants control. The, the motive might be a little suspicious. The other thing is that depending on how much money you want to raise, you may want to structure it with a mix of a loan and equity. So let's just say you value the business at 100000 mm -hmm. and you are looking to raise, let's say, 80000 So technically, 80000 out of 100000 the guy should take 80% of your business. A simple math like that. However, because you don't want him to take more than 50%, you say to him, give me 40000 um, to buy uh, equity or an exchange for equity and give me another 40000 as a loan at a concessionary rate. Now, the second 40000 is a loan, so I'm going to pay back. So essentially, you've only bought 40% of the business, so you don't have to see control. Then what you do is that you give the guy an option to be able to convert that loan into some more equity when the business is bigger so that that 40,000 doesn't cede your control. So there's several arrangements. One, one of them is what I've just described. Okay. Okay, that's, that's a good example. You can go on. <laughs> yeah. Number five is consider a loan. I mean, it's one of the things that you, we're typically not recommended to do if you absolutely, absolutely have to. Um, oh, actually, sorry. Number four, before number five. Number four is look for grants. Um, grants are essentially somewhat free money. Um, grants, competitions, etc., that give you funding that you don't have to pay for, or that that pay for some of your R and D, some of your research and development, underwrite some of your costs. So again, just reducing how much more money you have to go into the ma open market um, to raise. So look for grants, uh, competitions, things that give you some information. Um, and, and financial or resource, financial or otherwise resources that you can use to grow the business. And then uh, number five would be go for a loan. Number six would be speak to uh, a venture capital uh, uh, company. Um, I get a lot of people ask me what's a venture capitalist or what's a venture capital company. So typically high net worth individuals, um, instead of holding their money and deciding who to invest in, couldn't be bothered. So they take their money and they go and give it to a group of guys and say, you are the guys who are an expert at doing this. Take my money, um, charge me a small fee to manage my money. And then when you see and evaluate a business that you think is good enough, you can use my money um, to, to invest in that business. So the group of guys that hold the money are what you call the venture capitalists. And this could be money from individuals or institutions. So you can approach them with your idea. Notice the way I have arranged the order of how you raise money. Yeah. It usually yeah. gets a lot more difficult as you go further down. Um, the, the documentation required, the requirements are usually a lot more stringent as you go further down. So this would be the actual raising of money. And then the last category I want to talk about are general tips that I, I, I share with, uh, with people when I talk about um, um, attracting funding. Number one is, is know your game. I say know your game. There's nothing more irritating that you, than you get an opportunity to sit and speak in front <laughs> of people who are prospective investors and you don't know your game. Yeah. It's really, so you should know your game. 
So typically, I would say, or personally, I advise myself not to invest in industries I don't know enough about. In the event that you do, you need to have somebody who understands the business very well, who's by your side and shows you the ropes. But you have to know your game. It's yeah. non-negotiable. Okay. Number two is that let passion fuel your idea. Okay. A lot of ideas will take time to mature. The gestation period will take time to mature. If it's not something that you're passionate about, when in the beginning, when the money is not coming, it gets really frustrating. What will keep you in there and keep you waking up every day and pushing at it every day would be some kind of excitement and passion yeah. to the idea that, you, that drives you. I'm sure for you, when you go into the studio, yes, you're thinking about the next big hit, et cetera. But the experience in the studio alone is enough food for you, even if you are not able to make that big hit that particular day. You know? So let passion fuel the idea. Because if you focus on money and the money that you, the money that you are expecting to make, um, you'll hang yourself before, before it does happen, if it ever does happen, because mm. it can get frustrating. Mm. Number three is keep a good business reputation. Um, it's a small city. It's a small world. That is, that <laughs> is a very important thing. Okay. So, and this Ghana we're, we did. We're, yeah, sure, Ghana we did. <laughs> so we're a group of friends, six, six of us, okay? And we know Ahmet. Ahmet is the guy who is always looking for an opportunity to rip me off some money. Always, it's coming up with one scheme one. Yeah, let's say, could you, could, could you, uh, somebody. <laughs> okay, could you, is the, the one who's always looking to scheme some money or someone. They yeah. come up with a business idea. I mean, I don't want to know, you know. People yeah. like to feel that uh, your word has to mean something. So a good name keep is a better good than name. riches in this case. Well, I'll take riches any day. If it's guaranteed, <laughs> I'll take it. No, no, no. In trying to attract funds, Albert, come on. Well, I know. Say it, say it properly. I'm not sure I'm sold on that added. I'll take riches any day. I mean, if you will take them, they'll take it. I'll take riches. I beg. The good name is to get riches. <laughs> so if I, if I can get the riches up front, what's with the good name? I'll take the riches. <laughs> you Charlie, you don't worry. Oh. <laughs> so... So, yeah, I mean, but the point really is, look, people know you for who you are. People know whether you're committed to an idea or not. You're not the mm -hmm. kind of person that's jumping from one idea to another, to another, yeah. to another. So, yeah, you started something again, but we know what's going to happen. He'll drop this in a few weeks, months, and then he'll latch onto something else. It's not my money that he's going to use for an experiment, you know. So, yeah. keep a good business there, okay? Number four is your skin in the game is the most attractive um, or the most desirable attribute when you are being evaluated by a prospective investor. But you have to have skin in the game. And the more skin you have in the game, the more attractive um, you are as far as um, um, drawing funds to yourself. Um, number five is that um, a startup that already has revenue, um, some kind of revenue, is always desirable. So Preferably, don't go raising money when you have an idea, you haven't started making money, or you haven't started selling the product or service, and you want to raise money. It's easier for an investor to say, okay, with the 100 cities that you have, you are able to generate 1,000 cities every week. So if I can give you 2,000, I can sort of project that that 2,000 will give me X multiples. So it's always better, it's always more attractive if you're already generating some revenue, however small the revenue is. Yeah. Okay. And then the, and to, to the last point, it's always better to have done a proof of concept so that um, you can answer questions in real life as opposed to I am planning to, I am planning to, I am planning to. So yeah, yeah. this would be my 666. Six for pre-fundraising, six for actual raising money, and six general tips for attracting uh, financial uh, investment. Six 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 pie. Why? What the wrong you have? Know, right? On a Friday. <laughs> like when when on a Friday when you have content in a cup, we cannot determine. <laughs> no, shout, shout out to Mattel, by the way. 
Uh, no, but I want to address something. I mean, obviously, being absolute brand ambassador, uh, people, by the way, uh, some of you startups you are on there, Absa will give you unsecured loans up to 500k if you have the capacity. Obviously, determinants on certain things, your average balance, etc. But you don't need collateral up to 500,000. Like that's amazing for me. I mean, in my mind. I mean, am I tripping out? It that's kind of something, right? I, I'm at. I'm back to the fact that you still didn't give me some of the Absa money. It's. I mean, we need to talk. About it. We really need to talk about this. Yo, it's the APSA value. We're not talking about APSA money. APSA value. That's what That's what the thing is now. Listen. Yeah, I, it's fine. Keep the value. I take the cash. Yeah. Look, I can't... I don't even know how you manage to go to 18, like 6663, which goes to show... My guy, we're going to do more of this, me and you. Um, but I'm, 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 I'm going to ask you one thing. In, an, in seven minutes... We have to wrap up in seven minutes, but quickly... You have to give me one of your worst failures, business failures, a story of one of your worst business failures. Hmm, interesting. So in 2002, um, um, I tried to run a magazine. I tried to launch and run the magazine. Actually did launch it, run it for about, about 14, 18 months. Um, took quite a bit of my savings um, and I failed quite terribly at it. Um, mm. I think it was timing was one, but also because it's not, it was not my field and it's never been my field. I'm not, I'm, that's not my area of expertise. So I was having to depend on other people to get the idea through, um, which is one of the points I made. So to put it uh, bluntly, I was not on top of my game. Um, I needed other people to, to drive the idea. And that be, uh, yeah. Okay, sorry, go ahead. Was that before? Zuba Shop? This was uh, in 2003. This was 17 years ago. 2002, 2003. Whoa. Yeah. But it was okay. an interesting it was an interesting idea. I actually enjoyed it. Um, I tried to run this magazine with uh, Kofi Asma and, uh, and uh, Kimati Kwenye here. I don't know if you're familiar with those names. But yeah, um, I mean, uh, it was fun Friday. while it lasted. Yeah, it was fun while it lasted. Um, it took quite a bit of my savings um, <laughs> and left me broke. Um, but yeah, I learned a thing or two about about uh, how not to how not to set up a business. Yeah, yeah. Since since money funds they uh, they can't drop some Jew. I, I don't know if you want this information, out, but I'm sorry, bro. You are my guys, so I'm going to give it out. Guys, I shot palm wine and whiskey at. A prop at the place owned by my brother Albert. This is the place where we would kick it, we would go and kick it at, right? In Burkusu. And, you know, he was generous enough to let us shoot palm wine and whiskey there. But you guys, so don't go and tell people, guys, I know this is online, but I beg, make you no go tell people so they go try Charlie, to find a place. I, I enjoyed the shoot more than you did, Charlie. It was, <laughs> it was, uh, it was uh, <laughs> in fact, so, so actually, every now and then, I actually go on to YouTube and watch that video because it just now that you've mentioned it, um, in this COVID and quarantine times, it might be a good idea every now and then to just go and drown myself in the thought of of the experience shooting the movie, uh, shooting the, the video. It was a good one, actually. Yeah, no, nah, 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 Charlie, we, we forgo there right now with the loosen up restrictions. We forgo social distance for 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 that, for that side. And play for one and whiskey. My last question. There's a lot of space. We we don't even have to worry about social distance. <laughs> exactly. My last question to you, though, is what's the best business advice you've ever gotten? What's the best business Hold advice up. I've ever gotten? Hold up. Let me tell you one thing. Look, Albert is full of Jews, man. He's a good friend because we kick it on a level, on on many levels, layers. But you know one thing you've told Fui and I that we, 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 we live by? Yeah, like don't sneeze, on, don't sneeze on small money. Like basically, yeah, that kind of thing. And for me, that is an amazing business advice that at which came at a point in time in my career that was important. It, did, it wasn't mean like take beneath your worth, but it means don't sneeze on small money. You can accumulate. You can. Yeah. Anyway, so back to you. Well, you're doing it again. You're, you're taking my job from me. I meant what? What? What is this? Tell me, but how we talk? So, how, what should I do? 
<laughs> well, besides that, what would be the other um, great business advice I would give or I have gotten? Hmm. Um, I, it would it would be that honestly. Um, okay. It would be that. I mean, because look, and and you know what I used to do before. Now I used to work with a lot of um, businesses, um, automating um, their businesses, software, um, that kind of thing. And I have seen some tons of money, and it's usually not with the big companies. It's usually with the Auntie Mansa, who sells spices in uh, Ipoboshi somewhere with a, with a small setup, and they are making small change every day, except that this comes in several folds and it comes in, 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 in large quantities. So they are making something like, think about it this way. I mean, if you're selling, what, five, six, seven, up to 10,000 CDs every day, and you're making a 30% margin, okay, just a 30% margin to be conservative, and you're doing this over 30 days in a month, that's 90,000 Ghana CDs every month. Mm. Now, if you have 90,000 streaming in every month, you're ahead of the game. Yeah, that's up. Remember, remember also, for a prospective investor, even for an APSA that might want to um, give you a loan, what excites them is that regular inflow. That regular inflow that guarantees them that if they do give you a loan, you have inflow that's consistent enough to be able to cover um, um, the, 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 the repayment. So it would be that. It would be not to scoff on, uh, on, on small money. Every, every little peso counts. Every little peso counts is the final word of the day. Because Instagram is going to cut us up. If I hear that line in a song, I'm suing you. Good luck to you. I have lawyers in my family. <laughs> uh, you know here. Yeah. <laughs> Me too, I get, uh, actually, my wife be lawyer, so don't bring oh, yourself. Yo, 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 but um, oh, uh, <laughs> hey, let me not forget. <laughs> yo, have a much love, bro. Well, Instagram yeah, is gonna cut great. us off in, because after an hour they cut us off. But yo, this has been amazing, my bro. And Charlie, we'll go do them again. And uh, yeah, part two coming up. Money talks with our bigger Zuba Shop guys. Go to zubashop.com. It's very useful and valuable to you, especially in these times, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, amazing. Yep. But no, thank you so much. And yeah, literally, Charlie, I don't even know what to say. But Charlie, we'll go link up. I will holler you after this. Most deaf, most deaf. Right, Take care, man. Still, wait, still waiting for the after money. You know, get problem. <laughs> send them, send them, Momo. Sharp, <laughs> sharpest. <laughs> All right, bless. Cool, oh, man. It was, not, it was fun talking to you. Thanks, bro. <laughs> Cheers. Hey, I'll go do him. And, yeah. <laughs>